at the moment, my principal personal task and the task of this little institute of Ita Wegman, Ita Wegman Institute for Basic Research, is to bring Steiner's intentions, intentions to the surface in relationship to the general anthroposophic, anthropos anthroposophy, to the anthroposophical society and to many life fields, the intentions, not only the results. So my feeling is that the intentions for general anthroposophy, but also why he formed a community for it, as we called anthroposophical society, this society is not the one we have now. There is a relationship, but Steiner's idea what it could be is bigger and much more interesting than what we have now. But what we have now is needed to develop it. So his intentions. And that's, I think that's the most interesting part in every human being's biography, what is intended. Because what is realized is a compromise between the outer forces of our lives and the sun sphere of our intentions. Steiner called of the sun sphere. And I think in Steiner's life it's especially tremendous if you get an entrance into this in intentional sphere. And not only always measure him on the reality we have now and to say, but the Waldorf schools are in crisis. So Steiner couldn't be a big teacher. In fact, they are not too bad about Waldorf schools. They could be better and they will become better. But especially if Steiner's intentions for a new education come back to the teachers. So my personal task is with writing books, with getting seminars, lecturing, talking to people, going to university, also being involved in education there on academical standard is to bring these intentions out of his collected works, out of his notebooks, so also fragments, not only in Köder's case or in Steiner's case, that's living anthroposophy for me. So that's one aspect of my own work and um, it's belonging to the future. It is not a historical work because there is a misunderstanding, it's not the past because this intentional sphere is this will sphere. And Steiner's collected works is in a certain way, for me... Is it the past? No, I'd say it is a kind of a, to a seduction in having a view to a collected works to be the past, to say there are many books and that's the past. Now what is inside the books? These are the seeds for the future. So in a certain way, Collected works, that means the past. But what is inside the books, these are the ideas of the future. So it is kind of, it is a misleading understanding. Uh, it is, it is, it is, okay. What, what, how would you, could you sum up what the intention is? Can, can one do that? What was, what was Steiner's intention? I don't think so that somebody is able to sum up Steiner's life or his intentions. I mean, we all clearly see that what he called the Christ impulse to bring into the culture, he was a servant of this Christ impulse, in certain way also a servant of this Christ entity. So to help that real Christ, Christianity, real spiritual Christianity comes into our culture and that has consequences for our social life, brotherhood of men, but also organization of economical fields, salaries and things like that, main social law, has consequences for education, has consequences for every field on human, and also in our relationship to plants, animals, our responsibility for earth, because Christ lived on earth. So I'd say, if you are really looking to one central intention, servant of the Christ, and this kind of, we can also say this kind of humanization 
because for him the Christ was the representative of humanity. So real humanity bringing in those fields. I know, but it's simple, but it's deep and simple together. Mm -hmm. And you're not talking about the Christian religion as Not at all. No. Not at all. So, you know, for Steiner himself, he always said that these representative of humanity, for him Steiner, Christ as the representative of humanity, he is, that's the aim of every positive existing religion. So for Steiner, he said, to come to an inner relationship to this Christ entity is the future of every positive existing religious experience. And he always said they will, they, they, they will not giving the name of Christ to this relationship, to this essence of humanity, but it's living in them. So for him there is an existing Christ impulse in many existing religions. So of course, it's, thank you for your answer, for your question, that's not at all a, conf a, conf a confessional task for him. So not talking about Christian religion, but Christian religion has a special task in, in a certain way in grasp many things and helping, but not as the aim of the whole religious evolution of mankind. So Christ represents our potential then, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah? Potential. Our potential. The Christ. Yeah. Yeah. What do you mean with potential? What we can become. What we yes. Yes, but not in every direction. I mean, we can also become an animal. The potential of human beings is a wide range think, in yeah. a certain way. Yeah. So that's the lighter aspect of our personality yeah. or let's say the intended human being. So from Steiner's perception or also from Schiller and other philosophers' perception, mm -hmm. there is a higher human being in our everyday human being and this Christ aspect uh, is this potential of to realize the real idea of humanity. So from my point of view, if you talked about Elie Wiesel or um, Martin Buber, these aspects of spiritual Judaism in the 20th century, these aspects of a real dialogue between I and thou, this is belonging to this future of humanity. This is, this is for me the Christ impulse in the sphere of dialogue. For me personally, the challenge of Rudolf Steiner is still Rudolf Steiner himself. For me, it's not only the fruits coming out, the spiritual results of his investigations. For me also, the man himself is a real challenge. That means a biography of somebody who was able to do spiritual research and to combine in his own person, own personality, own lifestyle, own biography, these two worlds, the spiritual world and this physical world, to incarnate a spirit in a certain way. And the challenge incarnating spirit in personal biographical processes and bringing it out to the culture as a deed in many fields of civilization. So that's for me the challenge, the real challenge to combine two worlds which are so separated in our usual thinking. And our experience. Really. Our own experiences, yeah. even if we have some experiences that yeah. these are not really separated yeah, rules, yeah, but yeah. from our state of mind, from our consciousness, yeah. we are so used to separate them. Because yeah. I think for, for many, many people who have a difficulty with Steiner or even ignore Steiner, it is because of this feeling, you know, how could somebody know so much with such clarity and certainty? Yeah. I mean, it's... It's, it is so beyond most, you know, our experience. What does that mean? Yeah. Spiritual research. Yeah. Of course, that's the, the important question. On the other way, you can see if you come to a certain key. I mean, Steiner, he came to a certain source and then he was able to bring this method into different fields. So in a certain way that he 
that he knew so many things in so many fields, because it's one of these kind of breach shots saying, is somebody able to say anything to medicine, but also to agriculture? But in a certain way, the tremendous point is the point of to come to a real relationship to the to the living spirit. And then it is not a question of the field. It is more or less a question how to come to the point where the living forces on earth uh, gain entrance in your perception. Yeah. And yeah. Because you used the word source just now. I mean, what, what, what are you pointing to there? What is this source that he's accessing then? For me, simply saying, I mean, this kind of source is his theory, but practice theory of getting higher knowledge. I mean, the source means uh, how do I get a real entrance to the, to the world of the living ideas, to perceive living ideas and to perceive where they are incarnated in the real existing world, so that the image of a plant is not only a kind of a subjective image, kind of a model, kind of a theory as we call theories today, but theoria in the old platonic sense that means to perceive an idea and to perceive it in shaping reality. And that means to come to such a close intimate perception of ideas, so to in a certain way to perceive the word of intelligence to perceive it, not only to think actively, but to perceive the process of thinking and to perceive where it shapes reality in the outside world. I mean, that's for me the key in Steiner's youth biography from the beginning. That was his main question. How came the inner, the inner perceptive world to the outer world and how, how where is the relationship? What is your picture your understanding of, of Steiner as a as a child what was going on my image is it was a, a unique child in so far that Steiner had many difficult situations to come into this physical body from the beginning he in his memories he's saying he was a, a heavenly crying child in his early childhood. That mean crying and shouting, is that right? Yeah. That the parents had problems just to calm him. And later on in his lectures for the teacher, Steiner said it's a good sign if a child yeah. is shouting and also crying sometimes heavily because it has a living spiritual activity and you know, he said to the teachers, you know, it is difficult to incarnate because the spirit has a certain space and he comes from another world. And to go into this physical body is a huge, tremendous task. And he's saying that we are all protected in perceiving this difficult situation. It's a kind of a protection. But if you go inside early childhood, you can see that is, this is a hard task to go into the physical body. So coming back to my image of Steiner, the beginning was not easy because for him to go into this physical body and also into this neighborhood, into this kind of surrounding was an extremely difficult situation. An extremely difficult situation because he had such a broad mind or he was such a, a broad spirit or it was, it was, there, there was a wisdom, it was a kind of power in his spiritual soul and it was not easy to come in and to get familiar with this world. For me, and it's also belonging to his youth age, for me Steiner was a person whose primary task and difficult task was not to gain access to the spiritual world. He felt at home, in, also in this world of ideas, this world of thinking, but the sensual world, this kind of physical world, he had to get used to it. So the balance, to come into the balance, this was a main task. 
And so he was spiritually gifted, but who had to bring it to a physical relationship. He was not at all ascetic in so far that he, hadn't, he didn't like the physical world, but for him the major task was to bring it together. And especially, I just end now, especially also to understand where is the relationship from, from my inner perceptions, which were ideas, not dreams, ideas, clear perceptions, to this outer physical world. He always felt a little bit as a stranger in the outer world, the sensual world, as a miracle, what is it? But he, he knew his thinking, the ideas, the own thinking activity, it was his home. So this kind of finding a balance and also understanding what is the relationship between the sensual world and our ideas of this world. So this was the main task. But he was fascinated with the technology, wasn't yes. he? The railways. Yes, yes. So, Absolutely I mean, fascinated. So that helped him then, did it, in this task? I think it helped it in a certain way that there was an attraction, as you said. So he was not somebody being apart from the physical world. He was, there was kind of, kind of a, yes, how, yeah, attraction is the right word. So it was not a, seduc a seduction, more an attraction. But in a certain way, this physical, technical world is a special world too, because in a certain way, it's like a third world. I mean, it's not only the sensual world of the plants and of the father and of the chair. It is kind of an artificial world. So th to understand the ideas of technique is a special task ahead. So in a certain way, with this, this special attraction, he was there. But to understand what happens in the technical world is a special miracle or a special task ahead. And on the other hand, you know it, this technical world and the spiritual world, this is almost the opposite. So in a certain way, he was living in very polaric organization and he said in his autobiographical writings you know them he's saying this attraction for this technical world brought a little shadow over the child and his heart so in a certain way it was also not the balance technical interests spiritual and being on earth so, but it belongs to this tension. So my image is a lovely child and he was wonderful to the surrounding. He was interested also in, in older, older persons and so he was part of the village, you know it, where he lived. But it was not easy to live in these tensions. Yeah. And geometry then? That was important. Sorry? Geometry. When he discovered geometry... That was a help. Was geometry. geometry. Geo geometry. Uh, Ge ah, geometry. Yeah. Geometry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was, yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> My English is quite limited. Yes, yeah. uh, it was a help in so far, but more or less not for the physical world. Because for him, this discovery that this is a world of laws, a world of inner organization in an a non-sensual sin, because for him this kind of mathematics was all the time of cosmos, uh, of a spiritual perception. It was not for him on the physical plane really, even if there is kind of an image of, so we can draw these things, but the whole laws acting in this field, uh, yes, they belong to the spiritual world, but human, human spirit is able to perceive these laws. I mean, this kind of, that is a structure in our ideas or in the non-physical world is a real structure, it's a real perceptive sense in it. Yes, it, it gave a certain feeling of there is a harmony and our human spirit is able to perceive this harmony, yes. It helped him, but it was not a help in the incarnation process totally. Not a central help, but one, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. And, and why do you think he chose to study science and technology? I mean, that, that was obviously a, an important decision, and to go to the technical university. Yes. I mean, more or less, <coughs> what he's saying, that it was not his own decision. I mean, it's an important part. It was not his own decision, it was the decision of his father. More or less, father wanted to have him as an engineer for railways. And Steiner was gifted. So he was bright, intelligent, open, and he was fascinated, as you said, by technique, but also mathematics and so on. So he was brilliant. 
but this brilliance wasn't a kind of a destiny way. He couldn't see it. He said, I did what Father wanted to. I was attracted, but it was not my personal decision. And he said in his autobiography, he was not thinking over this so much because he had not this kind of what this kind of ideas of what I want to do by professional work later on as many of the youngsters or 18 or teenagers have. He said he had deep questions about what is human life and deep cognitive questions uh, and not this outer life was not so essential for him. So he did what father wanted. In a certain way it belonged to his destiny. So I'm quite sure he's one, he's a spiritual researcher who, who had to go really deeply into the technical world besides this our world today. And if spiritual research is sensible for the future, it must have a deep relationship to the technical world. So in a certain way it belonged to the signature of his whole existence, but even Steiner understood this, his own life later. So, you know, Kierkegaard, a philosopher, once said, we live forward, but we understand backward our biographies and also Steiner so I'm not I'm a, there's a little contrast of my own view to his biography than many of his biographers from the anthroposophical point they say he had he was he was yes he was a clairvoyant person and so he clairvoyant also for his biography but we can clearly see that he needed time to understand his early decisions it was not his own decisions but the decisions of his life and also, uh, yes. So I'd say it was not his, his from Nursley point, it was not his consciousness decision, but father's dream and future stream. And he said, yes, why not? My main questions are not this kind of, yes. And what about Felix then? The meeting with Felix? Yes. The significance of that? Yeah, for me, it was one of the most important things in his youth. Felix Kokutsky, you know, and he was the first man, Steiner said, I really could talk openly about spiritual experiences. That's one essential part for understanding Steiner's whole biography, how alone he actually was in his life. He mean he had some followers, he had friends, he had two wives, I mean he had a social surrounding and they understood him even if Mary Steiner understood him more than Anna Oenicke. But in fact, as a spiritual researcher, he was quite alone, also in the anthroposophical society, as a spiritual researcher, and especially in his childhood and youth. And he mentioned that several times he tried to talk to his father or the family about impressions, about spiritual ideas. There was no sense at all. And they also had no culture in so far that they didn't read books. They had no relationship to religion. They had no relationship to music. It's so important to understand that he didn't grow up in a surrounding where music or rel religion or painting, colors. There was nothing there. They were living there in these factories or railway stations. And then he was totally alone. And then suddenly he discovered a man who really had own experiences in the spiritual world. So it was the first man on earth to talk to as a friend about spiritual impressions, but not only sensations, also ideas, shaping ideas. So what is living in a plant? What is the idea of a plant? And what is the idea of missile in contrast to other plants and so on. So living experiences in these two worlds, I'd say, that the spiritual world is incarnating in the physical world. Yes, and so far it was a tremendous experience. And, and would you say then that his encounter with Goethe is the next important turning point really then? It's in relation to this? In relation to this, Goethe is in in so far the next step in and it's also interesting how he came to Goethe I don't know because you have to study his autobiographical writings in detail how he came to Goethe it's very interesting he's saying I studied anthropology at university and not only studying by reading books his studying was to have a clear 
view what is a human being. And he had, from the beginning of the 80s, he had a kind of a feeling that we have a physical body, but we had also a kind of a spiritual body. And it's belonging together, and it's a, diff a different situation in the head organization than in the limb organization. So soul and body are in, in they have a special relationship, and it's, it's not the same in the heart organ than in our brain. So we, we, we should have a clear image, not only the relationship of our soul and or spirit, soul and physical body, but the differentiation. So he studied what he later called a threefold human organization. And he, he got first results at the beginning of the 80s, first results, first insights, and he, he couldn't talk to anybody, to anybody. They all said, you have only have an idea, in so far you have a kind of a, a theory. But Steiner said, in a certain way you can see it. You can have, you have a closer look to what is, what is the structure of a human, of a head. It's totally different to a limb structure. You can see this idea. And then he discovered Goethe's encounter with Schiller. And Goethe was designing Schiller his idea of a plant. And Schiller said, only, that's only an idea. And Goethe was in a little bit, he was um, aggressive in a certain way in saying, oh, if you mean that's only an idea as a concept, I say you, it's wonderful that I see these ideas with my own eyes. Because it was an experience and you can not only in your brain. And Steiner said, it was for me, it was a kind of, a, in Germany we say, Erlösung. A liberation, is it? A liberation, but in a certain way also a kind of a calming of my soul. Yeah. So my inner struggle found a kind of an answer. Or in this case, he found somebody, it was Goethe, who had the same relationship. And to find Goethe, and in so far it was the next step to find that Goethe had also a possibility to have a closer look to what is a plant or an animal and not only say we have some, some kind of theories but to see this kind of sensitive and super sensitive aspect and that Goethe was able to perceive it in a deeper way and then he began to study Goethe's scientific writings about what human and nature bodies. And in so far you have right. The encounter with Goethe, it was a real encounter, was in, in this stream it was a second step in this kind of incarnating um, spiritual ideas in physical bodies and to perceive the outer world in a deeper sense. Yeah. Yes. And then Weimar, I mean that's a lonely time too, isn't it? Or would you see that as continuing this how do you see his period in Weimar? Of course, you have right. In so far, <laughs> yes, he was a stranger in the archives there. I mean, you know, he was invited to be a part of a scientific community editing Goethe. It was strange because he was young. He didn't, he hadn't studied Germanistic or so. He was not one by profession. He studied technique. But he edited Goethe in Vienna and his first Goethe edition was a wonderful edition and so he got, there are many circumstances, he got the invitation to come to Weimar. But then he came in a typical archive situation and they wanted to, to do the collected works of Goethe on the standard of professional work. That means every keynote, every text of Goethe and not only this, but Steiner from the first beginning, his intention was to publish Goethe because it is a challenge in the name of your film. Goethe is a challenge. It is not only the old Goethe, it is a task and it's also a question. Goethe is a question for the whole culture of human being in this kind of getting insights, in this kind of getting insights in natural science, have a feeling for living earth, what is a plant and a relationship? It's another relationship to the cognitive process and to the surrounding and so on. So Steiner wanted not only to publish Goethe's collected writings, to bring his ideas in the world. And so what he did there in the collected works was quite interesting because his own, his own 
the volumes he edited by himself, he made a different method, or he just his own way through this collective verse, he says, what you do there with only your collective uh, works there with the other volumes, this is not my. So for the, the, the natural science, we need another thing. We need the important texts. And this one, which are not important, we bring them later. And if the text is important by the content of Goethe's ideas, it is not necessary that it must be a complete text. It can be a fragment. And they wanted to, to publish fragments and they wanted to publish finished text. But Steiner only said important is what is inside the text. So he, he wanted, of course, he wanted to judge. And of course, they didn't want to judge. So Steiner had this kind of impulse. And in so far, he was a, a lonely person in this, um, in this standard conventional editing concept. And in many other fields, he was also a lonely person. But on the other hand, I'd say he has a relationship to this spiritual aspect of Weimar too. Insofar, he wasn't, he wasn't lonely on the whole plane. Because for him, the relationship to the dead was a an, real aspect. And to come to a place where Goethe really lived and where his handwritings are, and probably you have been to Goethe's house in Weimar, it is living spirituality. And Schiller, and so these old houses are not only buildings with walls, there is living spirituality. And Steiner had many friends there under the artists, so the actors and the younger generations in the, in the city, and there were many interesting new developments. And he was all the time interested what's going on because he was all the time looking, are there spiritual gifted people in the younger generation? So I'd say my picture of Weimar is, yes, a sad experience that, let's say, professional editing concepts are not concepts in bringing ideas, new ideas in the world. They are just restoring the past. And Steiner was only living for the future. And last word from this sense, he was only interested in Goethe in some segments. Only this Goethe, this aspect of Goethe, which is a future aspect, was interesting for Steiner. So he never was interested in the whole Goethe. Or let's, let's say he was interested in the whole Goethe, but he only wanted to bring the, the future Goethe. And so his Goethe books, also the Nietzsche books, he was selecting. So, and some said it's not scientific. But he always saying the future task is our task. And in, in some aspects, Goethe was average. He was as you are and I am. But that's not the interesting part of Goethe. If you have a look to modern biographies, they try to find out where Schiller is on our level. And they bring it in their books that he loved probably more the sister than his wife, the sister of his wife than his wife, which is not real true. But it's for them a story. And in, so in this sense, Schiller is not interesting. And Steiner didn't want to have a look to them. It's interesting, but it's not the part. And so this kind of only interesting what is the future in Goethe. And this sad experience that these sciences are not really interested in the future. They are only Goethe experts. So in their far he was lonely. Yeah. But I see not his own existence was lonely, from my point of view. And was it inevitable that he had to, uh, as it were, meet the theosophists. I mean, do you, do you think that his, his life and what he brought could have come about without meeting the theosophists? From, from first point of view, absolutely. I mean, Steiner's, if, if, if you see the continuation in Steiner's scientific work, if you really see that his first writings about Goethe and especially about his own cognitive theory, this is a line of anthropolo anthropology. It is not only cognitive theory, it is the freedom, human capacity for freedom in the thinking process, that we have really possibility to come into a real connection to the spiritual world with our own ideas, that we are free in so far and that we are believed to a spiritual world and we can realize 
ideas which we conceived in the spiritual world and to make them motivation for our physical deeds. So we are, we are spiritual researchers in a certain way and we realize our own accepted or uh, wanted ideas and bring them into the world. And it's its own, his own way was to incarnate these kind of spiritual ideas and he didn't need any theosophists for this. So there's a clear, clear line from his first writings to the philosophy of freedom to his own later writings. So I see no gap at all. From his outer life, in fact, this group was the first really group, not only a single individuality as Felix, who wanted to hear Steiner because his own experiences in Weimar and later in Berlin, that he tried to bring in his spiritual aspects in a very yes, soft way, in a certain way, he tried to make it acceptable. Not compromises all the time, but not to bring it all and to shock people. But he all the time tried, what, what, is, what can I say and are they able to, to catch it? And he realized also in the artistic, in, in, in the field of the artists, they didn't accept it. Af yes. And then he many he had many pre chadis or I don't know, he didn't like the theosophists. He knew some of them, more or less. And but he went to the he he, he got the the, the, in, the invitation and he went. And he realized in lecturing that they were really spiritually open. So he, he realized that they were spiritually open. So yeah. they listened to his words. And he could speak more or less frankly, more or less openly about spiritual aspects. So imagine 40 years, or let's say 20 years, of hide yourself in a certain way. Steiner had, had a hidden biography in Weimar too. So he was in many, in many friends' groups, but his own ideas, he kept them. So it was the first group in a certain way to invite him and to ask him. And if you really study his life in this time, he never adopted to the Theosophical Society. From the first day he said, yes, I go in or I work for you, but I bring my own contents. And his content was anthropology. I mean an anthroposophical uh, anthroposophical view to what is a human being. For me, Steiner was no theosophist in so far that Deus was not, was not his primary intention. His main question and also the challenge for our time, what is a human being? What is a human being? And we saw it in the 20th century. That is the tremendous point. Elie Wiesel said in Auschwitz was murdered not only the Jewish people, the idea of man, the idea of human being was murdered in Auschwitz. I'd seen Steiner would say, yes, Elie Wiesel, you are right, but you have to accept that the idea of human being was murdered in the end of 19th century. With this materialistic approach, what is a human being? It is a physical body and the brain is a physical thing. And what is our soul life? It is an epiphenomenon. It's no reality. If you draw the consequences of such an approach, what is human being, eutanasia and many other things, eugenics. Euthanasia, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. This is a kind of a result. This is a kind of a consequence. And we all know that these ideas were in the world at the end of the 19th century. So Steiner would say the idea, what is a human being, that is, that is the challenge. If we conceive a re the reality of a human being and bring it to civilization back because it's lost in the strong impulse of materialistic natural science, it is sensible that it came in, but it needs a counter force. So the same force for natural science, we need also spiritual science. And coming back to this point, um, Steiner's main intention in the Theosophical Society was from the first day to bring in a real image of human being and a real anthropology. And he, from the first thing, from the first day, he said, and in this stream belong to the development of human consciousness, 
to a philosophical stream. So he accepted this Eastern aspects of spiritual life because, as we all know, there is much spirituality in the Eastern part of the world, but he knew that for Middle Europe and for the scientific development of human being on the whole globe, the main question is if we have a real scientific aspect to the spiritual world and not only a religious or oriental old spiritual one. So in a certain way he accepted that there was a group and an international organization even who was interested and engaged in a certain way, um, motivated in bringing spirituality and he tried to transform it. And not only in 1912 or 10 after certain struggles from the first day and we have wonderful letters from Steiner from autumn 92 too. He's clearly saying what he will do. So there's a strong continuation. There was no, no break. Even if many biographies saying that he adopted to them because they had no other chance in Berlin and later on, no, from the first day he had a clear program and so on. This materialistic picture of the human yeah. being is, is surely still very dominant, isn't it? Or do you think that's changing? There are some optimistic people in our world. They say the materialism is behind us. And in so far, I would say, if you have looked to universities, if you have looked to many um, scientific fields, we can say that the open-mindedness is greater than it was in the beginning of the 20th century or the end of the 19th century. If you have a look to the physics or if you have looked to every natural science, it's not still the simple model that there is a physical substance and so on pushing the other atom and you know all these things. But so that's from my point of view that the theoretical thinking in many, in many fields, also in medicine, there is a big improvement in so far that many, many discoveries clearly show that the old image of the materialistic uh, view of the world, you can't keep it. And also the concept of substance, it is much more spiritual now, in fact. But on the other way, Steiner would say, and I would say, that's not, but that's not the whole reality of our world. What we see is the technique and also these forces who pushing our culture into a material culture, they are even stronger than in the beginning of the 20th century. So we have a big contrast in between new thinking and reality of life. And reality of life, that means the situation on the globe concerning our own relationship to landscapes, our relationship to plants and animals, how we handle them. And just a simple example, we can talk about National Socialism and saying, as I said it, what they did as a consequence of a materialistic thinking, in also in kind of racism, in kind of social Darwinism, with all, all, all aspects of materialism, I'd say, in eugenics, yeah. it's over. Now, we say it is a bad, bad period behind us. But if we have a look, how many pregnancies were interrupted at the moment because there is a hint that it can be a handicapped child. A hint, only a hint. And we say then there shouldn't be handicapped children on the world because it's no need to have a handicapped child. And there is no question who is judging this and is there a real soul which is on the beginning of his earth biography who is judging this? I think it is a materialistic approach to say there is no soul and so on. So we have many practices, just a simple example, but we have many practices where we practice materialism still, so a culture of the physical body. And the rest, the other one is a, an, an additive, but we have no spiritual culture on the Western world saying that um, the spiritual and soul aspects, they have to sail entity, they have to sail strong, they are real as the material, the sensual aspects here. So I'd say the materialism period is not overcome. 
even on the field of thinking, there are many progresses, but on the other way, the push into this culture, into this physical body, life culture, is quite strong. So anthroposophy is a challenge, also insofar, from my point of view, it is the major answer in the 20th century to this trait, the major answer. So what Steiner brought in, even if the group of the anthroposophists is still small and the society is weak, we can say, but what he brought into the world was, was, was a real answer to the mainstream of the materialistic and also the scientific development, but out of humanity. Peter, I'm interested, you know, Steiner is on the whole best known for the work in education in agriculture and medicine. But all, all those initiatives came about because he was asked, asked questions or asked questions by the farmers and the doctors. What, what would have happened if people hadn't asked him those questions? To be honest, I don't believe in this interpretation of his biography in so far that, let's say, let's talk about medicine. He really talked about medicine in many, many lectures before one doctor even asked him. Because, as I said, he wanted to bring an image of what is human being into the world and it belongs to medicine. So for me it's fascinating how late they asked him. And if you have a closer look to the development of the pedagogical problem, he started to give educational lecture lectures in 96. And if you have a closer look to them, he waited what will happen now. If there grows initiative, nothing happened. And then he let it do. So then later on, they came after the First World War, as you know, Emmy Mold, 10 years, 12 years later. So we can see in many, many aspects, Steiner, he brought ideas and seeds, and then he waited. So, I, 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 so it, it, for me, it's too simple, this, this interpretation. They asked and he answered. He, he brought anthropology, I, I, I mean, an inside what is human being, and it has practical consequences. And he shaped these consequences. And then he waited what will happen. Because, of course, the initiative to bring it to the world and to combine your own life to take over responsibility, he wanted, and that's for me, it's one of the wonderful things, he let people completely free. Also Steiner's way of lecturing, from my point of view, it's different from many modern lectures in anthroposophy, no fascinating atmosphere. In so far, he, he didn't want to fascinate people. And especially he didn't want to talk or to influence their will. If you bring enthusiasm, they just went out of the room and they, they do anything, especially to found a school. And Steiner gave, not boring, but other lectures because it was so necessary that they really in their freedom get an inner relationship to this idea and not direct it to their will directly. It's very interesting because then anthroposophy is something you need to insole by your own life. So back to your question, what in a certain way it is not possible for me that nobody asked him because somebody really, if somebody really, they also asked Martin Buber, what are the consequences of your philosophy of I and thou and so on. If you bring a new insight for this human being, it has consequences. So it was no question that they asked. They asked late and especially they, in the practical aspects, they asked that if they wouldn't ask, have asked him, I'd say he remained to be a teacher for spiritual development. And that's one of the big sufferings of Steiner's life, from my point of view, 
that he had to wait. Are there people or are there no people? And it, it takes time that forces grow in them, so they have to come to the point. And he couldn't do it for them. So he would have remained, as he did in many fields, only a teacher for spiritual development. And then waiting what will happen. And if not, they take it to the spiritual world after their death. And it's a seed for the future. So, mm. and probably we can say it's only a small group who asked. And they asked late. The first Waldorf school in 96, after the First World War, such another chance for development, growing internationally. Eight years before the worst world wars began. So they missed it. And so in the last few years of Steiner, everything happened in a high intention, only a short period of time, and then he died. So in a certain way, he gave the answer to your question. He waited and gave lectures and wrote books. That's it. Does it um, uh, distress you that Steiner isn't better known in the world now? It distressed me, but um, more in relationship to the persons who don't know him or had no chance to know him or get such a distorted image of Steiner by some biographies, articles. So they were protected, not protected, but they were... They were really not living in a prison, but in a certain way they have no chance to meet him. Isolated. Isolated because for me, I didn't grow up in an anthroposophical family. I was not in a Waldorf school, not at all. So I was 21 when I suddenly had a chance to read a book of Steiner. So I had no, not at all a positive relationship to this anthroposophical lifestyle or field. I was absolutely skeptical. And... I had no chance to find it 21 years, uh, my whole long period of youth. And some of them have no chance to find it for their whole life. And I say there are wonderful ideas for the future and also for your personal development. for your. And so it is so sad that they have no chance to find him. So I'm not always looking to Steiner. Oh, poor Rudolf Steiner, because he really had the power to be a person of the first range of this range saying, yes, we had Albert Schweitzer and Mahatma Gandhi and Sege Jung, your films, I mean, and Tolstoy. And of course, we want to have him on this platform. As anthroposophists, we like to have him on this platform, but it's not a task at all. That's not a question at all. The question is where the ideas of humanization come into cultures. And in so far, it's a misery or it's a bad and a sad situation that Steiner himself as a guarantee for this idea. So because it's not a question that they all know him with, with his biography in detail, but he is also somebody incarnate in anthroposophy that makes for, for me, makes him so interesting. Not only anthroposophy is so interesting, he himself, because he was living anthroposophy. And to come to gain a relationship to him would be for many people an, a possibility to get a taste what anthroposophy meant to be. Because many anthroposophists um, have not the possibility to open the field of anthroposophy for, for human beings or for, for many other people. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's part of the answer. I mean, some people's reaction when they read Steiner or read a little bit of Steiner is, oh, yeah, I mean, they certainly find it difficult, but they also find the tone of it dogmatic. I mean, is, is, do you think there is, that's a legitimate uh, criticism? Or is that really to do with the time that he lived in, um, the style of speaking and writing at that time? Or do you think it's the, the, these people's problem? It's too easy if we always only say it's their problem. Yeah. 
But to be honest, for me personally, I never could perceive a dogmatic position in Steiner's writings. I'd say his written writings, his real writings, not the, the stenographed lectures, they are difficult to read in so far that they need such a, a spiritual activity in reading. If you only perceive the words and sometimes to bring your own interpretation to these words, it is in so far a simple reading and it's a misleading reading. I'd say it is necessary to, to bring your own warmth and to bring your own soul and to bring your own spiritual activity actively to these texts. And in so far it is an unconventional way to read today. I think many of these people who have these negative feelings, they would also have a problem to understand um, some of the philosophers of Hegel's time. They are not dogmatic, but to have you go, to go into the spiritual process and not only saying there are words and words and consequences and it's pushing me into these consequences, there is an active part. So the dogmatic aspect, I don't really see this problem in Steiner's writing because they are really, is it, for me it's an evolution of ideas. It's, but, but you need to be, to be absolutely active in reading. And it's difficult if you, are, if you are at the end of the day or I don't know, if you wait for a book which gives you anything, which helps you, which supports you. You need help in your life or you need answers or you need warmth. It doesn't come out of Steiner's book, this kind of warmth and soul. And he once said, sorry for that. I, 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 didn't feel, I, I felt in writing books, I didn't feel free to bring soul and warmth, but it, I didn't want to influence people. They have to bring their own warmth and soul to my ideas. And then they see they have a relationship to the soul and the heart, but they have to find it. And it's for me that, that's for me the point where why he is not an attractive writer at the moment. Because quite often we wait for these qualities that they come to us because we are longing for them and it's a bad author if he doesn't bring it to them. And for him it was a kind of a, yes, he felt sorry because he wanted to help people, but he wanted more than this, he wanted to let them free. So that's, that's the essential point, it's the freedom. And you can help people and give them your own treasure, but finally they live out from your treasure and they are dependent. And that's the last thing Steiner wanted to have, dependent people. And so he had to restrict in a certain way, to retain things and to say it in an intellectual, in a certain way, very clear and intellectual, intellectual tone. For many people it's cold. So the dogmatic point is for me not the one. The cold one, I can understand if they say, Yes, it's a philosophy of freedom, but where is, where is the ideal? Where is the power for the future? And so on in this book. It is in the book, but you have to find it. I don't know. It's only part of the problem. But Steiner with his life until 1914. He was lecturing in different countries. And he, from the beginning he knew that it must be an international movement not only for anthroposophy, but the modern movements for spiritualization of the humanity must be international, a brotherhood of men, and then this falling back into nationalism, this falling back into isolation, nations, war, military forces. And you can clearly see he was really preparing anything. It was all destructed. So in a certain way, it was the end of this kind of international movement for anthroposophical anthropology. And on the other hand, the war brought in destructive forces which never healed until today. If you really go 
closer to the history of the First World War. It brought in so many destructive potentials, never healed, and Europe, never the same Europe than before, has never been also in this wonderful book of Eric Hobsbawm, The Age of Extremes, mm -hmm. clearly saying that Middle Europe until then, or whole Europe until then, was an important place for the world, for cultural, scientific de development, no more since. I mean, there is a stop of no old Europe trade, and then other forces came in, and with this whole Ost-West confrontation, and this and the tragedy of the German development. And Steiner was fighting, fighting not physically, but very interesting his lecture in this world period against the national trade in Germany. He wanted to bring the humanity aspect of German-Austrian culture. He failed completely. Ludendorff and his follower Hitler they came, and you know probably that Hitler wrote his first highly aggressive article against Steiner in 1921. In 1921. And Anthroposophy couldn't live in a world and couldn't incarnate in a world where these forces are there. And Steiner realized that after the World War, where the National Party was strong in Germany and the chaos was strong, the poverty, the radicalization, there was almost no chance to bring in the seeds for the new culture. And then his time until his death was an incredible hurry up to try the last things in an incredible short time with a small group of persons and as a counterbalance to these destructive forces. And for me it's quite sad only to let's say, about this famous Christmas conference. The anthroposophists talk a lot about this theme, special conference in Dornach, but it's so important to see it, that it happened six weeks after the first trial of Hitler to come to the government in Berlin, in Munich. So it's a counterbalance. It's not only an event in the story of anthroposophical society, and you can see it in detail, we have not the time for it, how Steiner's initiatives, their counter-initiatives to what was going on in the field of education, medicine, creative education, or murdering the handicapped, and so on. And he knew it and he saw it. He knew what will happen with the handicapped children. He didn't say it to the young anthroposophists because it was paralyzing their will. He never afraid people. He only, appear, he only helped them to find positive, optimistic, creative forces. But he, he saw it, and we have proofs that he saw what will come. But he concentrated not on this kind of abyss, but in these chances. And so I see the last few years an incredible hurry up, incredible do it, try it, helping, and then dying. And, uh, yes. We haven't talked about reincarnation and karma, Peter. I don't know whether, I know Steiner felt that was something very important to bring a sort of modern understanding of, yes. of those uh, laws, if you like. Do you, do you want to say anything about that? Many things are well known, yeah. only one aspect, which is important for me, not only personal, but also as a little investigator or researcher in Steiner's life, life work, life intention, is this absolutely social aspect of his karmic research. In, an, in a radical expression, you can say Steiner never was interested in who he was, he himself. His interested in these karmic questions are it should be a help to deeper understand who is the other one. So to deepen the interest in the other one, that's the way also to the destiny question. And Steiner's whole way as a researcher and also as a social person 
were to deepen the interest, the question, we have a conversation today about who is Jonathan Steder, but not the question who was he in the last life, but who is he, what he's doing, what are his life intentions, what he brought in, what is the special gift of this man as a filmmaker. So to ask, and to, we talk about life intentions, but to ask after the life intentions of the other one, not only my own life intentions. Steiner was interested in the life intentions of the other one. And if you ask in this way, you come clearly to, to this question that somebody brought in anything, a special capacity, a special gift. We can also say, yes, a special gift to humanity. So everybody is a single individuality who brings anything in. And Steiner said, everybody has a mission. A mission, not only the big person on the platform. Everybody has a mission that also means he has a task in this life. And to get this feeling for biographies that human beings come with a task, and also the handicap come with a task, and the handicap to live with the handicap and to overcome it is part of their task. So in certain way, if you stop their biography, we prevent them from taking over their tasks, their tasks, and our tasks. So this kind of feeling for biographies as a period of time in which we come with tasks and we work for this task and we go with the results and bring the results in, in the future evolution of ourselves, but also of humanity. And Coming back to this question, because it's the interesting point, we now have the, have, have the selfish uh, entrance to the karmic question. Selfish in so far that so many people are interested who was who, who is who. And in, also in the anthroposophical movement, there are many, uh, yeah, breed shadows, who is who, or this kind. And in Steiner was selfless. In so far, this culture of selflessness is one of these main intentions to prepare this kalpha, but a kind of, a, not a selflessness on the old form with the, uh, with the sacrifice of the eye that it vanished. No, to reinforce it in the selfless direction that, to, that you are with your eye, with your personal higher self, with the other one. To be not, a, not in my, but to live with Jonathan in the conversation, to be, live with in, in his eyes, and to be interested, this is a special case, where, where is looking to me, who, who is the other one? And this, come to the point, this kind of also researching in deepening the interest in the other one. And you can see it in Steiner's autobiography. He's never interested in himself, but in his friends and in Goethe. And then, then of course, you come to these questions. What is Goethe's special contributions? What is the intentional sphere of his life? Because he couldn't realize everything. And how we can help the other one in now in our life to fulfill his intentions. How we can help Jonathan to make the next films. And so on, yes, to, to ask it concrete, to, to support the other one. And not only after he had died, because in, our, in the anthroposophical field we have this wonderful culture of looking back, if somebody has died, we gather and we ask his life intentions, but we should bring it into life and to help the other one to bring it to bring his support and his his gift. You mean while he's still alive? While he's still alive and yeah. not afterwards only. That means to concentrate on the higher self of the other one, mm. to his positive things he brought to our world. What was Ita Wegmann's role then in helping to bring about Steiner's insights into medicine, into the human being? I mean, he needed, I presume, he needed, he wasn't a doctor, so he needed that companion, is that right? Yes, of course, of course, if you want to... Uh if you want to support a special medical uh, development in, in, in the direction of anthroposophical medicine, you need doctors. <laughs> but we can probably ask what is Ita Wegmann's specific 
contribution because there were many doctors and there were more academic doctors than she was. Um, and Steiner, in relationship to Wigman, always stressed, mentioned that she had the courage to heal. Courage to heal. Healing courage. The day before he opened the first courses for the doctors, uh, in the Goetheanum, he said in a, in a general lecture, the will to heal has become science. And now science has to become again will to heal. So in a certain way, to be a scientific doctor is not at the same, it can be, but it's not the same thing than a healing person. And in Ita Wegman was an enormous courage to heal, incarnated. I also feel that it's really a question of courage, because we can ask, what is courage to heal? And Steiner said, yes, it is, in a certain way, to have courage to bring these future forces in a situation where destruction, destruction is overwhelming. Is overwhelming destruction. Yeah. I mean, helpless situations or situations where you lose every, every belief in a recovering patient. Also in a recovering culture a recovering civilization. You, as a doctor, a child psychiatrist, you, I presume, have experienced this courage to heal. That means something to you personally in what you've done as a doctor. Yeah. Yeah? It is very personally, not, but not only personally. Yes, I think as a doctor, in every severe case or situation, you feel this inner experience of losing the ground where you're going. You're losing your inner security, you're losing your knowing, and you're losing your being sure that you can heal or, let's say, deeply help somebody. Because healing doesn't mean all the time to make him healthy on every plane, but to can help him really substantially. And there are many reactions possibly reactions, afraid, being afraid, or to go into your textbook, or to the text, to the standard of medicine, or only to the statistical results. So because these are also re reactions of being afraid not to be able to do, or not to lose your inner moral intuitions, your inner judgment. So it's also a Christian question for me, because Christ said to the disciples, you are able to judge for yourself. To regain, because I think courage to heal means also gaining the courage to find the healing thoughts, the insights, and you have to find them personally and not in the textbook only. That's like to bring your own, your own inner personality on the thinking, feeling and willing field into the actual situation and not to withdraw. And I, own, I know this situation where you want to go out of the room, out of the situation, out of the patient, or to go back to the standard of science, standard and things like that, or to gain or regain a new inner security. And I come to the point, I think every real connection is you need to lose this inner security and to regain it again in the encounter. I can also tell a story about Ita Wegman about this topic, but I don't know if you have time. It's an interesting story. There was a Dutch uh, anthroposophical doctor, very famous, Dr. Mees. And as a medical <laughs> student, he was severely ill with pneumonia. And he was in the action of dying. And he was in a standard hospital in... Netherlands. And then he heard Ita Wegman will come to his bed. And at once he felt absolutely sure he will survive. But then, it's the story, then the story begins. She came 
And Dr. May is later said, then there was a moment and she was palpating and so on. And then I felt she was helpless. And then I lost every last hope. But it was a short moment. And then she had the security and said what he has to do. But I think Dr. Mies, he was sensitive enough to feel that there was a little period where you have to lose your ground and find it in a new way. And I think to survive this moment or just to be able to go through it, that is courage to heal. So it has to be found in a, in a actually yeah. in, a, in a real encounter and it's not a balanced situation. So it's very interesting for Miss, Miss feeling this, she has no ground, even she is the leader of the medical section, but then she regained it. So, sorry for this no, anecdote, very, but it's interesting. Yeah, it's very, very and I know this sensitive period in myself in the encounters with my psychiatric patients that I lose the ground I had before, then they came in, they start with their story, I feel helpless, and I go through this feeling of helplessness, and then and out of them, I get an idea. Because it's actually not my own idea in my brain, but it belongs to his or her future. So I need a deeper, deeper relationship to her or him. In the creative education course, Steiner said, the handicapped children will help you in helping him or her, because the real needed help is in their real entity. So you need to deepen your interest in he or her, and then you will find what she needs. You can't find it in your own soul or in your textbook. So it's also, we can say, it's a courage to go into encounters. And that's a task of our time and the future to go real into encounter with persons. And it was Ita Wegmann's big um, capacity to meet people in such a deep way and to meet them also in these emergency cases. Mm. And so, so that's, I think that's her, her part in medicine. There are many other aspects. That's, that's, that's courage to heal from my limited point yeah. of view. It's yeah. a lovely. Thank you.